All right, let's get into it, guys, if we can. I want to bring in NBC's Garrett Hake, standing by for us on Capitol Hill. Jake Sherman is co-founder of Punchbowl News and an MSNBC political contributor. Um, Ashley pratt Oates is a political strategist and a board member of the group Republican Women for Co- Progress. Welcome to you all, guys. Thanks for joining us on this. Um, Garrett, let me just start with you on this one and ask you if Kinzinger's words are really resonating with Republicans there um, on the Hill overall, if, at all, could kind of move the needle for them, saying they want to separate their legacy really from the former president. No, Yasmin, I don't think they are. I mean, Adam Kinzinger gave that speech yesterday to an empty chamber hours after the House was done for the week. I doubt many of his fellow Republicans even saw it or read it. I think um, Kinzinger's style of going directly at former President Trump and his autocratic tendencies is not uh, something that's been widely embraced, obviously, by his fellow Republicans. And the only other Republican in the House who had a similar style, Liz Cheney, met a similar fate. Both lost in primaries and will be going home. I do think to the degree that there are those who agree with Adam Kinzinger within the Republican conference, they're trying to find their opposition uh, a little more strategically. We've heard it a lot in these last couple of weeks uh, when Donald Trump has said things about you know throwing out the Constitution or he's had these dinners with anti-Semites and so forth, yeah. where we've seen criticism of the activity but not of the man, whether there is kind of the more full-throated criticism and try to return to a different set of principles guiding the Republican Party in the future as Kinzinger lays out. We're not there yet. Um, Ashley, there was also a lot of reporting in the lead up um, to the midterm elections about Democrats essentially funding kind of these far right MAGA candidates, right, to kind of in a way work uh, against them so that their Democratic candidates could have eventually win out. Right. Kinzinger also addressed that tactic. Let's play a little bit of that and then we'll talk on the other side. Many of you have asked me, where are all the good Republicans? Over the past two years, Democratic leadership had the opportunity to stand above the fray. Instead, they poured millions of dollars into the campaigns of MAGA Republicans, the same candidates President Biden called a national security threat, to ensure these good Republicans did not make it out of their respective primaries. This is no longer politics as usual. This is not a game. If you keep stoking the fire, you can't point the fingers when our great experiment goes up in flames. What do you make of it, Ashley? Do you think Democrats deserve some blame here as well? For sure. I mean, he's correct on this. Good Republicans are exiting Congress for that very reason. When we're propping up candidates who are extreme and we're pointing fingers at that, they need to be looking at the fact that they're funding these candidates because they know they have a better chance at winning in their, you know, elections later on in the general. So I think that this was a great point brought up by Kinzinger and hopefully every Christmas holiday. And that is this major spending bill, right? They got a week to get this thing off across the finish line. Um, But according to what you wrote this morning in Punchbowl, they got to get it all right in order to get it done. They have to get it together. And and you're hopeful, Yasmin, about getting it done before Christmas. Garrett and I have been talking about the prospects of that in recent days in the hallways (laughs) of the Capitol. Um, This is going to be a 4,000 page, $1.7 trillion bill that is going to be dropped, uh, let's call it Sunday or Monday, and then voted on in the Senate on Wednesday uh, or even earlier. Uh, It's a a gigantic, gigantic bill um, that is going to get bipartisan support, wide bipartisan support, because that's the only way to get it through. Um, But remember, the the key here is that any single lawmaker from either party could slow down this bill to a crawl. And with the government running out of money one week from today, um, that's going to be an important thing to keep an eye on. Also, furthermore, Mitch McConnell has said that he will not vote for a bill if it comes up later than Thursday. So there is there are uh, there's less than a week to to get this done. So, um, yes, it is it is widely bipartisan. It will fund government through the end of of September 2023, um, but it's not without its hiccups and its complications as we try to get toward the end of the year here. I've been watching a heck of a lot of Christmas movies as of late with my kids. Is it bad to hope, Jake, for a Christmas miracle? That's all we want at the end um, of the year. You're also talking about Kevin McCarthy, as you wrote this morning, who's trying to get his members to vote against um, the spending bill. But you actually go on to say this, and I want you exp- to explain it to us if you can. Um, vote no, but hope yes. 
Yeah, well, uh, to your earlier point, Yasmin, this is the face of no hope. But um, I, yes, the vote, <laughs> hope, the, the vote no hope yes idea is that Kevin McCarthy, despite what he says publicly, uh, does not want to shut down threat in January. That's the other option for them to kick this to the first quarter of next year when Kevin McCarthy is going to either be, in his view, hopefully in his view, uh, a, a new speaker Um he doesn't want to have to deal with a government shutdown threat on, uh, you know, January 15th or February 15th. That would be an un, uh, unnecessary distraction for him. So while he says that he doesn't want an omnibus, that it's, that it's you know, uh, overdone and too much spending, he, he benefits. He probably benefits the most from getting this done. He wouldn't have to deal with government funding until the end of September 2023. Ashley, Jake just said it right. Hopefully wanting to be um, speaker. The problem is he doesn't necessarily have the votes um, as of yet. We're also learning now that he delayed all the races for committee leadership um, spots until, I believe, after the speaker election uh, in January. It feels like this is a recipe for chaos in the new Congress. Yes, but isn't that the Republican Party right now? They're just in complete shambles and they're reeling. I mean, Trump's candidacy so far for his third bid at president is flailing. Uh, Republicans have no idea how to be on message. Um, you know, you've got Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney who have been trying to make sure that the Republican Party rebuilds. And then you've got people like Kevin McCarthy who run a mar a over to Trump to make sure that he's in good graces with him. I, I mean, this is a party that has no idea what to direction they're in because Mm. their platform is Mm. empty and has been. It's been the platform of Donald Trump since 2016. And until they realign on what their priorities are, this is what we're going to see. And I don't know what Kevin McCarthy's chances are moving forward of being speaker, but it's not a very strategic move what he's doing right now. He's just setting it up for more chaos. Garrett, speaking of Donald Trump, um, talk to me about Monday. What can we expect in this final um, summary hearing from the January 6th committee? Well, look, I think it's almost certain that the January 6th committee will refer him to the Department of Justice for prosecution on which exact charges remains to be seen. But the January 6th committee started out with members who had all voted to impeach Donald Trump. Uh, Through the course of their committee, they laid the attack on the Capitol at his feet. And they argued in court findings before federal judges that they thought he was guilty of various crimes. And so if they do anything short of referring him to the DOJ, I would be shocked. Um, The question is, what kind of evidence do they provide beyond what we've already seen? Uh, both for him and for any other referrals that they might choose to make. And those, by the way, could run the gamut from other referrals for criminal prosecution to referrals to the Congressional Ethics Committee or to state bar associations. Uh, So I think Monday is kind of the day of reckoning where the the House uh, January 6th Committee turns their investigation into something where they can say, all right, here's what we've come up with and here's who we think needs to be held responsible. And Yasmin, it's going to get totally blown away by the next Congress. But remember, this committee was constituted in part to make legislative recommendations for how to prevent another January 6th. That's part of their mandate here. We might get some of that in this report, but it's likely that none of those recommendations, should they be made, will ever see the light of day. Certainly not when the Republicans take control of the House come January 3rd. Ashley, what are you going to be watching for on Monday? Oh, man. Uh, I I think the criminal, you know, counts at this point would be what to focus on here, because then, you know, is Trump actually going to be held accountable for what he did? And should he be allowed to run for another presidential bid? The answer there should be no. Um, So it'll be interesting to see what happens on Monday and the culmination of, you know, all of these investigations and how this moves forward with Republicans controlling Congress. Uh, Ashley Prado, thank you. Garrett Hake, thank you. Jake Sherman. Happy birthday, friend. Thank, thank, thank you for joining you. us on, on, your, on your birthday. And, and maybe you can put in a, a wish for a Christmas miracle. How about that? Just lift some spirits. I, 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 will, do, I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Appreciate you guys.